Hello, everyone. How are you doing? My name is Nat Kendall Taylor, and I help lead an organization called the Frameworks Institute. Um, I'm a psychological anthropologist by training, and the, for the last 20 years, I've studied how culture influences the way that we think. Uh, and what I'd like to talk to you about today is how psychological anthropology, particularly the idea of cultural mindsets, is a potentially really powerful but largely untapped strategy that we can use in our mission to better navigate misinformation and build trust in science. So the conference organizers very kindly asked that I not use any charts or graphs in this presentation. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that I got off on the right foot right from the very beginning. Um, what you see here and notice is that as of December 2021, 22% of Americans indicated that they had not much or no trust at all in scientists. That's almost one in every four Americans saying that they do not trust science. And as a scientist, and yes, we count too, social science is real science, I find this incredibly striking. Um, did not think that would get an applause. Uh, and so trust in science matters because as it goes, so goes our ability to have all of the effects that we want to have, to use science to solve social problems to use science to move society forward. But trust in science, it turns out, also matters because of a very interesting emerging relationship between trust in science and misinformation. So numerous studies are finding that where trust in science and science understanding and science literacy are low, our susceptibility to misinformation is high. Okay, so, so nothing terribly new at this point. Probably everyone in this room realizes that trust in science matters. Certainly nothing Nobel-worthy, but this is where the story gets kind of new and interesting. So most of our efforts to build trust in science are educational in nature. We teach people about science to build their knowledge and improve their trust in science. And this work is incredibly important. Do not get me wrong. But I am here to tell you that there are other routes and there are other tools at our disposal, and I believe incredibly strongly that in the world in which we live and the challenges that we face, we need to be exploring all routes and using all tools that we have. And it turns out that trust in science is also influenced by these things that my people, that psychological anthropologists, call cultural mindsets. And cultural mindsets are these deep, implicit assumptions and understandings that have, our effect, that have their effect in shaping our thinking below the level of conscious thought. They are incredibly powerful in shaping how we see the world and how we act in it. It's important to note that we all, each and every one of us, have multiple mindsets that we can use to make sense of a given social issue. Some of those are productive. They open conversation. They allow us to consider new ideas and solutions. Others are counterproductive. They can close down thinking. They can derail discussions. And they can keep us from engaging with new ideas. Most importantly for us here today, the choices that we make and how we communicate, how we say what we have to say, has the ability to activate certain of these mindsets where they can shape our thinking and background others. So let me give you a quick example to make this kind of real and concrete. Um, individualism is a very dominant and powerful cultural mindset in American culture. This is the idea that the world is the way that it is, that outcomes are the way that they are, as an exclusive result of how hard we try, of our decision to or to not exert our willpower, drive, grit, and gumption. And this isn't wrong, right? It turns out that decisions and willpower matter. But when we adopt this as our dominant lens on the world, there's a whole bunch of things that surround us and shape us that drop out of you, right? Things like resources, institutions, policies, relationships, and local contexts. And so just like individualism makes it hard for us to see that what surrounds us shapes us, there's a set of mindsets that we use to think about science that can actively impede and get in, our, get in the way of building trust in science. I want to tell you about two of them quickly here today. The first is this sense that science is capricious. Right? When people think in this way, science becomes something that we can't trust because of the rapid pace at which it flips and flops and doubles back on itself. Right? You have a very good sense of this mindset being active, as you can hopefully see in the quote there, when people start talking about scientific studies of wine or chocolate or eggs right? or coffee, my favorite, 
Um, and clearly, this undermines our ability to have trust in this institution. Second, kind of less capricious and more nefarious, is this sense that science has a hidden agenda. And when people think in this way, science and scientists become these agents who are out to pull one over on the public, to hoodwink normal people, and are willing to manipulate data for their own interests and gains. Now, this is clearly related to a larger, and, and other re research we're finding, growing sense that the system is rigged by those in power to disadvantage the rest of us, but we can see that this is a fairly direct and frontal assault on trust in science because of the way that it positions scientists as actors willing to do the public harm for their own interests and gains. So I want to pause here and make sure everybody hears this. This might be the only time today that you hear this. There is good news, okay? <laughs> so there are also a set of mindsets that we can activate that build people's trust in science. Again, I'm going to tell you quickly about two. The first is this sense that science is a source of awe and wonder and that people are deeply amazed and engaged at the way that science can teach us and help us better understand how the world works. Now, you can clearly see already that this is a fundamentally different lens that people can adopt that allow them to approach trust in science from a different perspective. So second, kind of more pragmatic but no less productive, is the sense that science is this incredibly valuable tool that we can use to solve social problems, this engine of innovation, this way of moving society forward. And again, you can see this is quite productive. So we're at this point now where we've got a set of mindsets that really are corrosive to trust in science and that increase susceptibility to misinformation and this alternative set that, that, that build and, and are productive to trust in science. So the question now is what do we do? And the answer to that question really comes from the other half of what I do with colleagues at the Frameworks Institute, which is the science of framing. So remember that the choices that we make, how we say what we have to say, has the ability to selectively activate and foreground certain ways of thinking where they become the dominant lens through which we see the world and simultaneously background others. And so what this does is it gives us a set of very concrete and applicable practices, things, first of all, that we should avoid doing because of their power in activating those unproductive mindsets. And the first is that we have to be really careful and aware that science says is not the reason we're giving people for why our findings matter, right? It turns out, I know it's really hard to believe, that science says is not the most engaging way of communicating what it is we have to say. Unfortunately, we do this all the time. Like, who in this room has used one of these phrases as a, the answer for why what we're saying matters? Like, I, I certainly have. And those of you who are not raising your hands are not being honest. Um, so clearly this activates, this is a great cue for that hidden agenda mindset. Second, we want to be really careful that we're avoiding unnecessary contradictions and hedges. Now, when we're talking to other scientists, qualifying confidence and being careful about probability is essential. But when we're talking to the public, what we have to do is be really clear about what we're finding, why it matters, and what remains to be learned. And I think about this as a continuum. So on one of this continuum, you have concise, ethical, appropriate, discussions of confidence, and on the other hand, you have things that look like this, right? This is an actual piece of science communication, and you can see I kind of ran out of red ink on this one. This is one long, ongoing, and continuous hedge, and this is like I could not have written a better cue for that science's capricious mindset if I had tried. So there's also a set of practices that we can deliberately advance in our communications because of their power in activating those more salubrious, those more productive mindsets. And the first is really leaning into the power of examples of where social science, and science more generally, has solved social problems. Now, we've done some work with this kind of strategy at the, with the academies, tested a bunch of different examples of science conferring social benefit. You see one of them 
on the screen right now, which is the way in which social science led to the addition of a raised position brake light on automobiles and how this saved countless lives. And in our experimental research, when people were exposed to this example, their support for dramatically increasing funding for science rose by 25% as compared to a control condition. So second, and this is kind of a pretty fundamental reorientation of how we think about communications, we want to move away from an approach to communications that is grounded in persuasion and convincing people of the value of science, and instead we want to move to one which is really focused on explanation. And most of the work that I've done for the last 20 years has really been on explanation. And I have seen again and again and again the value of an explanatory approach in shifting mindsets and open up think opening up thinking. I want to give you a quick example to show you what this looks like. So what you're going to see is a quick before and after video here. This is a gentleman in the London borough of Brixton who's talking about childhood obesity, right? So you're going to see... Uh, him answer an open-ended question about childhood obesity. He's then presented with an explanation, in this case a metaphorical explanation about the food environment, and then he's asked the same question after that explanation as a follow-up. And I want you to notice the difference between the before and the after, and I should say, it will not be hard to spot the difference. <laughs> Immediately, I, I'm thinking that maybe the parents are um, are coping with their children in maybe the wrong way. They're feeding them too much, giving them food to keep them immediately happy. What would you say needs to happen for child obesity to go down? Well, as I said, it's eating less and moving more, really. It, it just come, comes down to uh, the things, with, you know, the producers of food, if, if they're making stuff that's going to make, uh, make us unhealthy, that needs to be addressed. Um, to how the food is marketed, how aggressive that is, and how much it's particularly aimed at kids. So this is a little obnoxious, but you noticed some difference between the before and the after, right? Um, and just a reminder, what, what you saw there was, was the power of explanation to foreground certain ways of thinking, what surrounds us shapes us, and background others, in this case, individualism. So the last thing that we want to be really careful that we're advancing are this practice of kind of leading with broadly resonant and highly shared principles. This is sometimes called values framing. And again, I just want to be clear, the broadly shared and highly resonant principles should not be science says, right? And we're seeing this really powerfully in work that we're doing right now with the Missouri Health Foundation and the state of Missouri on gun violence, where we're testing a bunch of different, both quantitatively and qualitatively, ways of kind of opening that conversation. So the first two of these I will just tell you, bombed epically, <laughs> right? So the first is that kind of strident, blamey and shamey message that we all know we should not be doing, but that we all do <laughs> all the time. The second is that kind of science says, science authority. Again, both of these were not only ineffective, but they were counterproductive. The third one, which again is this appeal to something that we can all agree matters, was highly productive in opening up you know, legitimate and considerate conversations about this issue. And I will say, even in focus groups that were composed of individuals who both strongly identify as Republican and strongly identify as Democrat. So hopefully at the end of this, you are with me in realizing the kind of power and potential of this approach, this way of thinking about cultural mindsets, these implicit understandings and our ability as communicators to activate them as a tool to build trust in science, and with it, all of those things that we care so much about, but also to have this incredibly powerful collateral benefit in decreasing people's susceptibility to misinformation. And I want to end with a quote. This is from Walter Lippmann, a communications scholar, political commentator, who has this great way of talking about cultural mindsets, even though I don't think he knew he was talking about cultural mindsets, and, and Walter Lippmann said, the way in which the world is imagined determines at any particular moment what people will do. And with that, I want to say thank you very much, and frame on. Thank you.